Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 42, Apollo Program Flight 7, Apollo 13, Part 1, Risk and Schedules. Last time, we turned our attention away from the magnificent desolation of the lunar surface to investigate an unusual room in Houston, Texas. Mission control had grown quite a bit since the early days of Mercury, in personnel count, responsibility, and capability. This small handful of skilled engineers squinting at inscrutable numbers on boxy consoles helped shape the history of human spaceflight and continue to do so to this day. After the erroneous signals from the heat shield latches on Friendship 7, the out-of-control spin of Gemini 8, the heart-stopping build-up to Eagle's landing, and losing the entire guidance platform during ascent on Apollo 12, the controllers in Houston may have thought they'd seen it all. The subject of today's episode would prove to be their greatest challenge and finest hour. But before we move on in our narrative, let's take a quick step back. On October 21st, 1968, Apollo 7 was flying its last day in orbit, the crew of Apollo 8 were preparing for the first voyage to the moon, and work on Apollo 10 was underway. The Apollo 10 service module was getting some upgraded oxygen tanks, so the old ones would have to go. They would be later upgraded as well, and then reinstalled on a flight a couple of years down the road. During the process of removing the tanks, the entire oxygen tank shelf unit was dropped, and fell about two inches back into the service module equipment bay. It's just one of those things. Both tanks on the shelf unit were inspected afterwards, and no damage could be found. It seemed that this incident might be similar to the incident where a wrench was dropped on the propellant tank of the Titan II rocket that carried Gemini 3. Just one more potentially disastrous accident that failed to manifest for the fast-paced 1960s era NASA, a NASA that embraced risk, had a job to do, and didn't have time for too much second-guessing. Moving forward again, that job had been accomplished. Twice. NASA's long-term future was still uncertain at this point, but the hardware was ready now and funding was still in place. It was time to fly our third mission to the lunar surface, Apollo 13. Apollo 13 would continue to build on the experience of the previous two missions by landing in a trickier area than Apollo 12, which landed in a trickier area than Apollo 11. As you'll recall, the landing site for Apollo 11 was chosen primarily with safety in mind, so it's set down in a giant mare, or ocean. You've seen the mare yourself, they're the big dark splotches on the face of the moon. With Apollo 12, precision was the goal, but the landing site was still inside a mare, which had its interesting points but is essentially a giant featureless plane. For Apollo 13, the destination was the Fra Mauro Highlands. This was a hilly region and was not in one of the mare. By investigating a different type of region on the moon, scientists would expand our knowledge of the moon's formation and dynamics by leaps and bounds. With that in mind, the crew training began to take on more and more of a geological component. Up until this point, NASA had been consumed with the task of the landing itself. There wasn't much time to think about what to do once people were actually on the moon. But by the third mission, scientists were clamoring to get more data. If NASA wasn't going to send a geologist, they should at least try to make geologists out of the astronauts. So on Apollo 13, the rock picking would be a little more careful. Specific types of rocks were targeted to either confirm or refute certain theories about lunar formation. Before and after rocks were picked up, the site where they were found would be carefully photographed, allowing scientists to construct some all-important context. The astronauts would provide detailed descriptions of their observations as they were performed, which let geologists on the ground help guide their scientific efforts. There were also some dedicated pieces of geological equipment. One I found particularly interesting was a specialized camera that was used to take close-up 3D photos of the lunar surface. I guess the idea here was to see what the lunar soil was like in its native habitat before some astronaut came along and threw it in a bag. In order to accommodate the not-so-bendy spacesuit, the camera came with a long handle so astronauts could get their surface close-ups while standing. Aside from photographing and picking up rocks, the Apollo 13 crew would also be deploying a second iteration of the all science experiments. 
One of the items in this package was a second passive seismometer, which would join the seismometer left behind on Apollo 12 in a growing network. Once they had a third, scientists would be able to triangulate the position of the rumbles they detected on the moon. Also making a comeback were sensors to detect the ephemeral lunar atmosphere, a solar wind collector, and a dust detector. A new experiment for this mission would study lunar heat flow. To do this, chains of sensors would need to be placed in boreholes dug 9 feet into the moon's crust. The holes would be drilled with the Apollo Lunar Surface Drill, which I suppose answered the age-old question on if it's easier to teach an astronaut to drill, or teach a driller to fly in space. Once the astronauts left and everything settled down, measurements would be taken at several different depths, allowing scientists to see how heat from the sun permeated the lunar surface material. The probes also had a small heater, which would allow them to see how heat spread from the bottom of the hole upwards. Neat. There were also the usual slew of minor tweaks to the mission plan based on lessons learned. For instance, no more flying through clouds if we can help it. Perhaps the most significant was that the descent orbit insertion burn was now a thing of the past. This is where the lunar module would separate from the CSM and then lower its periapsis to just 8 miles above the surface. Instead, the CSM would perform this burn with the LEM still attached. The LEM would undock, and the CSM would then return to its circular orbit where rendezvous was easier. Having the CSM do this maneuver added up to 15 seconds of pre-landing hover time thanks to the fuel saved. And as we've learned, 15 seconds of hover time can make quite a difference. Choosing the crew for this mission was not straightforward. Following the standard rotation, we would expect that the backup crew from Apollo 10 would move up to be the primary crew of Apollo 13. So allow me to introduce the Apollo 13 crew. Commander Gordon Cooper, Command Module Pilot Don Isley, and Lunar Module Pilot Ed Mitchell. Right? N not quite. It turns out that Deke Slayton, Master of Astronaut Scheduling, had other plans in mind. Not impressed by Gordon Cooper's commitment to training, or lack of it, Slayton had already decided that Cooper would not fly again unless he was required as a backup. Similarly, Don Isley's performance on Apollo 7, coupled with rumors of an extramarital affair that could lead to a tricky PR situation, meant that he too was serving purely as a backup, even if he didn't know it. Slayton still thought Isley may fly in the post-lunar Apollo applications missions, but that's a whole other can of worms. Instead, Apollo 13 would be commanded by the first American to fly in space, and the first human to perform a complete spaceflight, Alan Shepard. We haven't heard from Shepard in a while, and that's because just like Slayton, he had been benched due to a medical issue. We'll get more into the details in a few episodes, but Shepard had been cleared for spaceflight again, and fellow Mercury 7 astronaut Slayton was all too happy to give him the slot. This made the Apollo 13 crew, Commander Alan Shepard, CMP Stu Rusa, and LMP Ed Mitchell. Except, yeah, no... Slayton's choice of crew was shot down, for the first time, over concerns that Shepard had been out of the game for too long. He could fly, but he needed more time. So Shepard, Rusa, and Mitchell were bumped out to Apollo 14, and the crew of Apollo 14 became the crew of Apollo 13. Follow all that? So, for realsies this time, the commander of Apollo 13 would be our old friend Jim Lovell. At this point, Jim Lovell has been on the show so much, he should get a co-credit for the podcast feed or something. Lovell had flown on the two-week flight of Gemini 7, the EVA perfecting flight of Gemini 12, and the maybe secretly best Apollo flight, Apollo 8. With this flight, he would become the first person to fly in space four times. It was also his final flight. Joining him in the descent to the lunar surface would be lunar module pilot Fred Hayes. Fred Hayes was born on November 14, 1933, in Biloxi, Mississippi. Hayes learned to fly in the early 1950s as part of the Naval Aviator Training Program. He then put those skills to use as a Marine Corps pilot from 1964 to 1966. He went back to school and, you guessed it, became a test pilot. Well, sort of. I believe we touched on this briefly in the X-15 episodes, but where a test pilot's job was to fly in all sorts of crazy ways in order to suss out the characteristics of a new airplane, a research pilot's job was to fly in all sorts of crazy ways 
in order to gather scientific data. Hayes did this research work for a couple of different NASA field centers before becoming an astronaut as part of Astronaut Group 5 in 1966. This was his first and only spaceflight. Rounding out the crew in the role of command module pilot was Thomas Kenneth Mattingly, who went by Ken. Mattingly was born on March 17, 1936 in Chicago, Illinois. He attended Auburn University in Alabama, where he received a degree in aeronautical engineering before he headed off to the Navy, who taught him how to fly. He stayed with the Navy for five years, flying the A-1H Sky Raider and the A-3B Sky Warrior aboard the aircraft carriers USS Saratoga and USS Franklin D. Roosevelt, respectively. He was in the process of becoming a research pilot when NASA came knocking in 1966, making him one of the 19 men selected in Astronaut Group 5. He served on the support crew of Apollo 8 and was co-backup command module pilot on Apollo 11. This would be his first spaceflight. Alright, so that was a little roundabout, but we finally got the crew of Apollo 13 locked down. Except, just a moment, I'm being told by my non-existent producer that there's a problem. It seems that just six days before the launch, backup lunar module pilot Charlie Duke came down with the measles, as well as Jim Lovell's son. And the trouble with the measles is that it has a two-week incubation period. This meant that the entire crew could have been exposed, with any stricken crewman falling ill while in lunar orbit. Not to worry, though. Jim Lovell and Fred Hayes had already had the measles, so were immune to the virus affecting Duke. But Ken Mattingly hadn't. The next day, the flight surgeon decided that Mattingly would have to be grounded for 10 days, which would cause him to miss the flight. There were a few ways to handle this. The first option was to swap in the entire backup crew. After all, wasn't that what they were there for? Sort of. The backup crew could certainly fly the mission, but the prime crew had made it their lives for the last few months. They knew the flight better than anyone. Really, the backup crew was there in case of a disaster, like the original crew of Gemini 9 being killed in a plane crash. The Gemini 9A backup crew had successfully performed their mission, but it would be a drastic step to take. Another option was to delay the entire mission to the next launch opportunity almost a month later. For whatever reason, this was ruled out. Keeping the mission on hold for a month would be expensive, and skills would wane, but it was definitely an option. Deke Slayton himself said that he later considered the choice to not push the launch to be a mistake but those choices are always easier in hindsight. Instead, we look to option three, swapping the command module pilot with the backup command module pilot. Breaking up a crew was an extremely difficult choice, but at least with the CMP, he'd only be on his own for long stretches of time, as opposed to the commander and LMP who really had to work as a tight unit during the landing. Just two days before the launch, Lovell and Hayes entered the simulator with their backup command module pilot to see if he had what it took. He performed well, and the crew accepted the swap. So that leads us to... Jack Swaggart was born on August 30th, 1931 in Denver, Colorado. In 1953, he received a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Colorado and then received a master's in aerospace science from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in 1965. In between that, he flew with the Air Force for three years and also had a job as an engineering test pilot for the Pratt & Whitney Company from 1957 to 1964. NASA found him while he was performing similar engineering test flying work at North American Aviation, manufacturers of the Apollo spacecraft, and he joined astronaut Group 5 alongside Fred Hayes and Ken Mattingly. This was his first and only spaceflight. Before the drama of the last-minute crew swap unfolded, the seeds of another story were beginning to take root. One of the last tests performed before the launch was the Countdown Demonstration Test, or CDDT, which was done a couple of weeks before the flight. This was essentially everything involved in the launch other than igniting the engines. The crew was suited up, they were loaded aboard their spacecraft, which now contained a nitrogen mix for these tests thanks to Apollo 1, and mission controllers worked the entire checklist. There were no major issues during the test, but there was one problem afterwards. One of the two CSM oxygen tanks wasn't draining, specifically Oxygen Tank 2. 
the copious records that accompany any spacecraft components were consulted, and it was learned that a year and a half earlier, this was the unit that had been dropped when being removed from Apollo 10. It had been inspected at the time, and it seemed fine, and the drop had only been a couple of inches. Now here it was, refusing to drain its cryogenic contents. It seemed that the drain tube had been damaged in the drop. This posed a serious problem, since the tank couldn't just be left full until the launch in several weeks' time, but they only needed to drain it this one time, and the drain tube was only used by ground equipment. It wasn't needed during the mission. So if they could just solve this problem right now, just this once, they'd be good to go. Time to get creative. Engineers put their heads together and came up with what they thought was a reasonable solution and ran it by the mission's commander, Jim Lovell. The plan was to use the tank's heater, normally used to prevent the slushy, super-cold oxygen from going completely solid, to gently warm the contents enough that they'd be forced out. It would take several hours, but thanks to the onboard thermostat and an engineer keeping an eye on the tank's temperature, the thermal load should stay well within safe limits. The alternative would be to replace the entire tank shelf, an operation that would likely take long enough to delay the launch. Lovell agreed with the engineers that the heater should do the trick. That night, the tank's heater was turned on for several hours as an engineer kept a watchful eye on the thermal readings. As expected, the oxygen was forced out of the tank, and the thermometer never rose above the maximum safe temperature of 80 degrees Fahrenheit. All of this brings us to April 11, 1970. Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swaggart climbed aboard their spacecraft, the oxygen tanks were filled once again, and everything seemed primed for a textbook mission. At 2.13 p.m., Apollo 13 roared off the pad, setting its sights on the Framaro Highlands. The staggering power of the S-1C first stage did its job, lofting the rest of the stack above most of the atmosphere before falling away into the ocean. But the S-2 second stage had a trick up its sleeve. Our old friend Pogo Oscillation was back, and this time it would claim a victim. As the vibration built up, the pressure in the center engine oxygen feed system ebbed and flowed before it finally dropped below acceptable levels. The turbo pump grabbed a big bubble of nothing, choked hard, and the engine shut down. Two minutes and 13 seconds early. That's pretty early. But while the flight dynamics officer's brain went through its own pogo oscillations as he frantically worked out the new trajectory, the other four J-2 engines were still burning. And thankfully for the mission, they stayed that way, all the way to their usual shutdown time, and then an extra 44 seconds on top of that. That mostly made up for their slacker colleague, and with an extra 9 seconds from the S-4B third stage, Apollo 13 found itself in a safe parking orbit. Whew! Each of these last few missions seemed to be getting a few of these dramatic moments, but it looked like Apollo 13 had handled its operational hiccup with ease. During the three-day trip out, there was the usual routine. For Lovell, it was old news, since he was the first person to be traveling to the moon for a second time. Navigational sightings were made, spacecraft housekeeping activities were performed, and photographs were taken, including plans for photos of a passing comet. The biggest concern was slightly high helium pressures in the LEM descent stage. If it got too high, a pressure relief disc would burst, forcing them to abandon the landing, though the crew would be safe. There was also a sizable nuisance caused by a troublesome hydrogen tank. Several times the crew had been startled by a master alarm when the hydrogen tank slipped slightly below expected pressure levels. It was still perfectly safe, but if they didn't keep a close eye on it, the pressure would drop just low enough to trigger the frightening alarm. One other oddity was that the sensors in Oxygen Tank 2 were acting up, reading the quantity as being off-scale high. This was a hassle, but it could be dealt with by stirring the tanks a little more often, just to keep its contents nice and fluid. The tanks were stirred around 23 hours into the flight, and then again around 37 hours. Several TV broadcasts were beamed down, though with interest waning in the general public, not all of them were aired. I guess when you only have three or four channels, two moon missions is enough. Two days and eight hours into the mission, Odyssey and Aquarius were 200,000 miles away from the Earth, and the crew was just wrapping up another TV broadcast. 
On the ground, mission controllers prepared to hand off from Gene Kranz's team to Glenn Lunny's team. Lunny's crew had been responsible for the night shift, keeping an eye on the spacecraft as the astronauts slept and making sure that everything was in working order for the morning shift. Just before the shift change and before the astronauts went to bed, Mission Control had a few housekeeping procedures to take care of. Capcom Jack Lausma called up, 13, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like you to stir up your cryo tanks. In addition, I have Shaft and Trunnion for looking at Comet Bennett if you need it. Command Module Pilot Jack Swaggart replied, Okay, stand by. Just over two minutes later, a lot of things happened at once. On the ground, controllers saw a sudden break in communications, along with some strange data and a loud burst of static. On the spacecraft, the astronauts heard a large thump, the RCS thrusters began firing wildly, the caution and warning lights sprang into action, and the master alarm began to sound. Simultaneously, Fred Hayes said, Okay, Houston, and Jack Swagger, talking over him, said, I believe we've had a problem here. Lausma called up, This is Houston. Say again, please. Commander Jim Lovell replied, Houston, we've had a problem. Next time. Well, I think you know what happens next time. Join us in two weeks as we find out what that problem was, what the solution was, just what caused it in the first place, and why carefully defining requirements is so important in engineering. And if you find yourself with a couple of hours to kill in the next two weeks, you might want to take a look at what Ron Howard and Tom Hanks were up to in 1995. It might just come in handy next time. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. <laughs>